New discoveries make for interesting history lessons. Case in point, the story of Richard Aoki, a Japanese member of the Black Panther Party. Who was on your original board of directors? I answered to a central committee. <laughs> Where did you get your initial funding? I can't comment on that. What obstacles did your organization have to overcome? The police. They kept impeding our progress. Joining us today is Donna Murch, a PhD and associate professor of history at Rutgers. And surprising enough that you have a Japanese man who's a member of the Black Panther Party who stands out, obviously, in the group, but now new revelations that he might have been uh, an informant for the government. Yes, that's right. Richard Aoki is very important in the history of the Black Panther Party. He's born in West Oakland and he knows uh, the, one of the founders of the party, Huey Newton, uh, from the time they were young. And most importantly, he supplied the Black Panther Party with their first guns, wow. including a nine, uh, nine millimeters um, and other weapons. So he was one of the earliest provider of arms to the party and that's why this revelation and this debate about the revelation has been so explosive. I would imagine, I mean, if, if this is the first guy who's supplying weapons, that would imply that the government had a place in uh, not just arming this group, but making it look more, of a, um, uh, look more dangerous than it was. Well, that's precisely that issue is the debate that's going on. Um, Seth Rosenfeld, who's an investigative journalist, published a book called Subversives about the FBI's war on student radicals and the rise of Ronald Reagan. So the entire book is a three decade long research project looking at the role of state surveillance and infiltration into the white student movement at UC Berkeley. Uh, when his book was published, it uh, August 21st, the day before the story was released, and immediately it was met with a firestorm. His initial claim was based on two interviews, one interview with a former FBI agent who had since died, Bernie Threadgill, who claimed that Richard Aoki was his informant, um, Richard Aoki himself in 2007, but by the time the book was released, both of these people had died, and there was a single FBI document that identified him as a T2. And there was a debate among scholars and um, policy people about what that meant. Since then, he was really met with a firestorm of criticism because of the limited nature of the evidence. The FBI has released further documents, which is what people had been calling for. These uh, new documents are between 200 and 300 pages of heavily redacted uh, internal papers mm -hmm. and they seem to provide much more conclusive evidence it's not still the nature of his um, relationship with mm -hmm. the party and with the state is under question but it appears that he was informing on the party from 1961 to 1977. Wow. Now we should uh, bring our viewers in on this as some may not know that this a lot of this took place during the 1960s uh, tumultuous time in the US uh, African Americans clamoring for more political power and the Black Panther Party came along at a point where it was you know by any means necessary to borrow a phrase uh, to, to, to get more empower the black community. At this time, though, you have a, an FBI that's infiltrating groups in the South, it's infiltrating the Black Panther Party, and they kept this all under wraps. What do we get from this as we move forward, looking at what the government was doing at that time? Well, thank you for asking that question, because to me that's a central question. Um, first, the first thing that we learn is that there is much that we still do not know about the scale of state surveillance and infiltration of radical social movements of the 1960s. And that it, the truth is, part of um, Seth Rosenfeld's book focuses on the major part of it, not on the Panthers. He actually has very little on the Panthers, but on Clark Kerr, who was the head of the University of California, Berkeley in the 60s, and Mario Savio, who led the free speech movement. So very broad surveillance, including of university professors and the president of the university. Wow. So I think that there's much that we don't know. He's been working on this book for three decades. Um, he spent an incredible amount of money getting these documents released because much of it has to be litigated with lawyers. So I'd say more than anything, we really don't know how much state surveillance there has been, and that has obvious resonance for questions of well, civil liberties today. That, that's my next question. Uh, how much does this resonate today now that people sit back and say, well, the government's doing things that are anti-American, that are, that are against the interests of its own citizens? 
Yes. Um, I think it's very relevant. You know, you have the recent passage of the National Defense Authorization Act, and in many ways, uh, the protections that have been established, many of those have been eroded since 9-11. So looking at this period in the 1960s compared to today, I think that there were more protections of civil liberties. So, so finding well, we heard that too, and we, we had the Patriot Act come along, and a lot of people were concerned about the infringement on personal rights. Absolutely. And, you know, currently there are a series of prosecutions going on of Occupy members. So I think that this history in the 1960s is relevant for what's happening today. What I would add as a scholar of the Black Panther Party, I wrote a book called Living for the City, which is about the genesis of the party, is that armed self-defense of the kinds of politics practiced by the Black Panther Party was a response to state violence and incarceration of young people. So that's a broader theme and that's something that you see throughout the country. Sure. But the question about the scale of state surveillance in the Bay Area, in New York City, and some of the places that were most politicized uh, leads us to ask how the state shaped these movements. All of this coming out of the story of a scholarly Japanese man uh, involved with a group of what the government might have called black radicals. Interesting story. Thanks for coming to share with us today. Thank you.